Ngayong binabalot tayo ng dilim at pangamba. Sabay-sabay ang pagkatok ng mga tanong na. Kaya pa ba? Saan ba tayo pupunta? May pag-asa pa ba? Sa gitna ng lahat ng agam-agam, may mga bagay tayong muling natuklasan. Wala palang pagsubok ang makakatalo sa tatag ng ating nagkakaisang puso. Nananalig? Nagmamalasakit? Nagbabayanihan? Nagmamahal? <laughs> sa bayan? Sa kalikasan? Sa kalusugan? Sa pamilya? At sa kapwa? Kaya anumang pagsubok ang kakaharapin? Masang may magandang bukas para sa atin. At pagkatapos ng lahat ng ito, sama-sama tayong tatayo. tatayo. All right, good afternoon and welcome to our third Livable Cities Lab. I'm Guillermo Luz, Chairman of the Livable Cities Challenge, Chief Resilience Officer of the Philippine Disaster Resilience Foundation and Associate Director at Ayala Corporation. I will be your host and moderator for today. To uh, begin things, I'd like to, to kick things off. I'd like to welcome the following mayors who are joining us today from around the country. Mayor Juan Carlos Medina of Vigan City, Mayor Lourdes Katakis of San Pedro City, Laguna. Mayor Lani Revi Mercado Revilla, Bacoor City, Cavite. Mayor Webster Letargo, Municipality of Gumaca, Quezon. Mayor Francis Frederick Peralta, Victoria City, Negros Occidental. Mayor Jose Cardenas of Canlaon City, also in Negros Oriental. Mayor Jose Ivan Agda of Borongan City in Samar. Mayor Eric Singson of Candon City, Ilocos Sur. Mayor Daryl Dexter Uy of Dipolog City in Sambuanga del Norte. Mayor Arlene Arcelias of Santa Rosa City, Laguna. Mayor Ronnie Dadivas of Rojas City, Capiz. Mayor Patricia Alsua of Ligao City, Albay. Mayor Mercedes Goñi of Bai City, Negros Oriental. Mayor Alfredo Pablo Ortega, San Fernando City, La Union. Mayor Felipe Antonio Remolio of Dumaguete City, Negros Oriental. Mayor Joy Belmonte, Quezon City. Mayor Grisel Lagman, Tabaco City, Albay. Mayor Lucilio, Lucilo Bayron, Puerto Princesa City, Palawan. Mayor Richard Gomez, Ormoc City, Leyte. And Vice Mayor Dean Anthony Domalanta of Municipality of San Mariano, Isabela. So welcome, uh, mayors and vice mayor, to the third Livable Cities Lab uh, here. Uh, so uh, thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for taking time to join us in this webinar. Uh, the Livable Cities Challenge and the League of Cities of the Philippines, in partnership with Globe Telecom, are pleased to present the Livable Cities Labs, a series of webinar sessions to deliver information, knowledge, ideas, and insights for better solutions for your city. In light of the COVID pandemic, the global lockdown has greatly affected cities around the world. Some cities have become epicenters of the epidemic of the pandemic, which intensifies the spread and transmission of the virus with their dense population and transport networks. In line with this, cities play a critical role when it comes to its containment and response. In order to give us information on how to address these challenges, this lab will discuss the best practices and sharing of experiences from experts, from experts on how a city and its people can work together to strengthen its community-based health services throughout the pandemic and to move to recovery and beyond to fully create healthy and resilient cities and municipalities. The webinar will also underscore how new solutions to the use of innovation and technology can help in beating the pandemic. We've assembled a panel of experts uh, and speakers to address these challenges. As we proceed, please feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom or on the comments section of Facebook Live so we can properly queue your questions for the panel discussion later. 
please be reminded that uh, this webinar will be recorded and a copy of the recording and the presentations will be made available after the session. <clears throat> uh, now, for some sessions, we will also uh, be polling, asking some questions and poll questions that will be asked of you uh, for us to better interact with you. And uh, let me just uh, start off with the first uh, poll question. Uh, not a health-related one, but the poll question is, where are you joining us from? Please pick your choices, Luzon, Metro Manila, Visayas, or Mindanao. Where are you joining us from? If you can see this in the box, all you have to do is just click one of the uh, uh, possible answers, and we'll be able to show you the results in a few seconds. So where are you joining us from? Luzon, Metro Manila, Visayas, and Mindanao. Okay. So about half the audience, 48% coming in from uh, Luzon, actually the rest of Luzon, 31% from Metro Manila. So uh, uh, almost 80% from uh, Luzon and Metro Manila, 13% uh, Visayas and 8% in Mindanao. So thanks for answering the question. Now we know where you're all from. Uh, and so let us uh, proceed with our first speaker uh, for today's Livable Cities Labs. Uh, for our first speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, a good friend, um, Sasha Bootsma. Sasha is currently the Technical Officer in Health Emergencies of the World Health Organization, or WHO, here in the Philippines. Uh, she has an in-depth knowledge of emergency and disaster management, as well as integrated community-based disaster risk reduction, health and water and sanitation programs, with over 20 years experience in development cooperation disaster preparedness and emergency response, mainly for the health sector in South America, the Caribbean, the Middle East, the Horn of Africa, South Sudan, Central Asia, East Asia, and now Southeast Asia. I work closely with uh, Sasha throughout this uh, uh, pandemic in what's known as the T3 task force. We talk to each other once in a while and exchange notes. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have her on board here at uh, the third Livable Cities Labs. So to give us the overview of COVID trends and its implication on public health care, let's please welcome Sasha Butsma. Sasha, please. Thank you, Bill. What a pleasure to be here. And thank you, everyone. Magandang uh, That's all the Tagalog I can do, I'm afraid. Uh, I will start uh, with my presentation. Uh, so my presentation will really be an overview of the recent developments in, uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic, not necessarily only uh, focused on the Philippines, but a more uh, a regional and a global perspective, which will have a major impact on how we all adapt to this new disease that we still know so little of. I mean, uh, I will share with you what we know and most of it you already know, of course, uh, as well. Uh, but there are also still many unknowns and that causes a lot of, uh, well, some call it fake news. Uh, we call it the, the infodemic of, uh, of wrong information out there that WHO uh, and the Department of Health jointly are having a daily task in uh, um, correcting and um, ensuring that people are uh, yeah, uh, known uh, or familiar with the, with the real facts and not um, at the, uh, yeah, the fake news, basically. Okay, so this is a, a fresh map from uh, a few days ago, which shows basically the, uh, the, the, the recent changes in the number of uh, cases of COVID-19 uh, globally. Uh, as you can see, Philippines is, is yellow, but then so is the United States and so is Brazil. Uh, and we know those countries are among the most affected, affected in, uh, with COVID-19 cases uh, globally. So this just shows the, uh, uh, the recent changes, meaning that there has not been uh, a major change in the number of, of, of newly reported cases uh, in these countries, including in the Philippines. And of course, we all know that the number of cases has uh, significantly increased in the Philippines in the past month or so. Uh, just to show you the difference between the different regions, uh, the, uh, these acronyms are always a little bit difficult, but um, uh, these are the Americas region, the AHO, Euro is the European region, Cero is Southeast Asia, Emro is the either Eastern Mediterranean, Afro is obviously Africa, and Wipro is the Western Pacific region that the Philippines is also falling under. So if you look globally, Wipro or the Western Pacific Regional Office 
Porter.who is actually uh, among the, the, the lowest in terms of the uh, number of cases that are being reported uh, to the WHO uh, on the COVID-19 uh, confirmed cases. So if we look in uh, among the countries that uh, consist of the, the Western Pacific region, uh, which is uh, Japan, Singapore, Australia, Malaysia, uh, South Korea, China, amongst others, as well as all the smaller uh, Pacific uh, islands, uh, but also Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, and Papua New Guinea, then Philippines is indeed uh, the, the, the main contributor to uh, the, uh, the, the total number of cases reported uh, from uh, our region, so to say. Uh, here to see a little bit of change in the number of uh, cases reported uh, from the different uh, countries that have been most affected. Uh, and there we can also see that, uh, uh, that the Philippines is really among the, the, the country with the highest uh, number of cases reported on a daily basis. Um, of course, this is an, uh, had the, the, there, there is also a good side to this. Uh, because thanks to the fact that we have a much better ability to detect cases, uh, that is also partially, of course, why uh, we are able to, uh, to report on, on this increase in the number of cases. Uh, we can also see that the, uh, the, the age group of the, 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 the well, having you here, you can see the four countries that we're looking at, but the age group uh, uh, of people affected or uh, infected, I should say, with uh, COVID-19 is becoming uh, younger. So uh, this is because we have a better capacity to test, so we're testing a larger percentage of the population. And as we will uh, later uh, discuss, uh, among younger people, of course, we have many more uh, people with milder symptoms or even no symptoms at all. So our ability to, uh, to detect cases, among specifically the group of asymptomatics, is uh, showing the, uh, had the effectiveness of uh, uh, both contact tracing and, and testing uh, systems that are in place in countries. And Philippines uh, is there uh, uh, a country that is really uh, doing uh, very well. Um, so I just wanted to highlight, because I think most of you would be very much aware of, of what COVID already is, uh, but this is really to address these issues on uh, the, 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 the fake news, so to say. So there's still so much unknown about this disease. I mean, we still don't know exactly the source. What is the impact on health? And that will have a major impact as well on our healthcare services. The transmissibility, I know you've heard a lot about uh, uh, aerosol and uh, all these uh, airborne uh, transmission. So uh, there's a lot of fake news about that. The transmissibility means the ability to pass the disease from one person to another and also immunity has been one of these topics that has come in the news uh, quite frequently lately. So in terms of the, the source of COVID-19, we still don't know exactly what the source is. We know it's an animal, so we know it's zoonotic. Uh, so there have been many, many researches already done, and it's only so far either a bat or a pangolin uh, that we can trace back to, uh, to uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus, which is called SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but it's not yet confirmed. And we still really don't know how it has been spread from also from the, from the animal to the human. So still, uh, we are very much uh, in the dark when it comes to the source of uh, the COVID-19 virus. A health impact. Okay, so like in Philippines, we see 91.9%, which is a very large uh, percentage of total cases is mild. Um, However, we know now as well that uh, uh, particularly among young adults uh, and those with un without uh, underlying chronic medical conditions, the recovery, uh, even if people had a mild uh, uh, form of the disease, can take much longer than what we initially said, oh, just in a couple of weeks, you're okay again. No, we really see that a lot of people are struggling to fully recover and get back to their, their, their health before uh, they were infected, which will have a, a major impact on how we uh, uh, well, treat people, uh, uh, first of all, but, but also uh, the, uh, uh, the, the burden that this will cause on the, um, on the health system. And then, of course, we should also, and, and there will be a presentation about this later, not underestimate the impact on mental health. And so still, so much is unknown of the, the longer term or even middle term 
impact on both physical and mental health from COVID-19. So transmission, but we know that that the disease is being transmitted uh, or spread uh, uh, through droplets from the mouth or the nose that then also can fall on objects and surfaces. And that is the way how we know this disease is being uh, uh, spread from one person to the other. But we also know that there's people out there that have no symptoms, so either the asymptomatic people or those that have not yet started to show symptoms can transmit the virus, which makes this disease extremely dangerous because you do not know if you have the disease, but you can already pass it on, which is again why contact tracing uh, and all the public health measures that the Department of Health and WHO are recommending are so important to follow. Um, children has also been a, a, a key issue in the news late, lately, uh, particularly, of course, uh, related to the discussion of um, reopening of schools. Uh, so there's a high rates of asymptomatic infections among children. So children have the disease but are not showing any symptoms. Uh, but we also know that there is a minimal spread among children, particularly in the younger age groups under 10. And these have been, uh, these types of uh, conclusions have been drawn from many uh, scientific research uh, um, that has been uh, conducted uh, globally. Uh, we have no strong evidence, and this is again important, uh, uh, to support that, uh, that the children amongst each other or adults to children uh, are uh, transmitting the disease in school settings most children are actually infected uh, uh, in households. Uh, so this is all, again, as I said, conclusions drawn from, from, from research. Um, we also have uh, not enough evidence to conclude that, that the virus that causes COVID-19 has mutated. So I know that there's been all these, uh, had the news about the mutation, but no, we do not have yet enough evidence to conclude that there is indeed a mutation and that uh, the, the new strain of uh, SARS-CoV is more transmissible, so more infectious. Uh, and there has been a lot of news uh, uh, globally uh, about mutation, uh, saying that it will be more infectious but less deadly. Again, there is not enough evidence for that. Uh, in terms of immunity, and this of course is very important uh, when we are talking about the use of rapid tests, particularly antibody tests, uh, that still WHO uh, is uh, um, uh, advising against only in research purposes are we recommending the use of rapid uh, diagnostic te tests. So rapid, both rapid uh, uh, antibody tests and rapid antigen tests. We are not recommending the use of these tests for diagnostics. Uh, so there's also still lots of things that we don't know about immunity. So most COVID-19 patients do develop antibodies, we know that, about one to three weeks after uh, they start uh, showing symptoms, uh, which is when many patients are starting to recover. Uh, we also know that people with more severe symptoms have higher levels of uh, um, antibodies, so meaning uh, that will uh, increase their level of, uh, of immunity. But we have no proof, this is a very key issue, that infection provides longer-term protection against reinfection. So still, there's also a lot of talk about reinfection, that has not yet been uh, uh, scientifically proven either, but also we have to bear in mind that there is no evidence that uh, once you have been infected with COVID-19, you will have long-term or even lifelong protection or immunity against the disease. Uh, and then uh, all the studies that, ha that have been done, uh, several prevalence study studies that also the T3 group has been actively uh, engaging in show globally uh, that fewer than 10% of the general population have detectable COVID-19 antibodies, as they call them, only in healthcare settings where, of course, healthcare workers uh, are known to uh, be at higher risk of actually getting uh, the infection. Uh, um, there is a much higher percentage of healthcare workers that have these antibodies, but among the general population, it is less than 10%. So meaning most people remain susceptible to COVID-19. And as we said earlier, it's an invisible disease and it will, and it will remain invisible. So contact tracing uh, and the isolation and the testing will remain key uh, components in our response to this pandemic. So back to the Philippines. So this is, uh, I, I, I'm sure you're familiar with these maps. These uh, are prepared by the Department of Health on a daily basis. So I've just compiled a few of them looking at how uh, the disease has spread throughout the Philippines, huh? from just a few yellow spots at the early days of March, 
uh, for, to yesterday uh, or the day before yesterday. Uh, yeah, the country is practically red. And of course, you all know this because this is uh, the information uh, that we get on a daily basis from the Department of Health. But it's it's good to see how in such a short period of time this disease has reached all the provinces uh, uh, and regions in, in the Philippines. Uh, so this is also a, a, an important graph from the Department of Health uh, that shows, uh, well, the increase clearly in the number of uh, cases of COVID-19 confirmed by uh, uh, RT-PCR tests. So uh, uh, the Department of Health does not use uh, uh, rapid tests at all. It's only RT-PCR uh, as well as gene expert uh, tests. So. Yes, we have seen a, a very uh, uh, yeah, uh, steady, I would like to say, increase in the number of cases and uh, had the, the number of cases that uh, are being reported on a daily basis have in the past months or so been uh, relatively stable, but, but quite high. Uh, yeah. So we can say, and this is uh, also in line with what the Department of Health is saying, that we are having a situation on our hands where we do see community transmission. Uh, obviously, uh, more in, uh, in urban areas, uh, particularly, of course, MCR, Region 4A and Region 3 are, are, are mostly affected. Um, but we also have to really uh, look at the broader uh, uh, aspect of things. And we have that real-time reporting. Many other countries in the world cannot state the, have the same uh, ability to report real-time uh, uh, data uh, from uh, laboratories uh, as is done in the Philippines through Kapit uh, Kaya, uh, the, the mobile application that the Department of Health uh, is using. We have expanded our laboratory network to 109 labs. I mean, that is, of course, also adding to the ability to uh, detect cases and to, uh, yeah, to report an increase in the number of cases. We've seen the relaxing of quarantine measures and, of course, the undoing of that, uh, because clearly that had a, a massive impact on the uh, on the transmission, on the spread, the facility of the spread of this disease. Uh, but we've also seen some poor adherence to the control measures that we all know what these control measures are. Uh, your social distancing, your use of uh, face masks, your, your, your hand uh, hygiene at community level. And not to blame anyone, but obviously some communities do not have access to uh, uh, um, drinking water even or even water for hand washing that don't have access to uh, sanitary facilities. So obviously these are all uh, um, attributing to the ability to spread this disease. And of course the very large influx and in that aspect the Philippines is really quite unique. Uh, the, the large number of returnees uh, from the, uh, the overseas Filipino workers as well as the, the locally stranded individuals has obviously uh, 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 greatly contributed to this increase uh, in the number of cases throughout the country. Uh, just here to show uh, that also, uh, thanks to the fact that we have the uh, large number of laboratories now uh, functioning, we do uh, um, yeah, uh, have a daily uh, testing output of on, on the overall uh, over 30,000 uh, tests per day, which is, which is significant. Um, we have here this, this wonderful uh, mobile application that is working uh, uh, from the Barangay Health Worker up to the uh, Epidemiology Bureau from the Department of Health at national level. So one database that, uh, that everybody is having uh, access to and that it is allowing for that real-time uh, information sharing. Uh, this is also a wonderful tool that the Department of Health has developed, uh, the health facility uh, reporting of essential resources and supplies. Uh, almost 2,000 hospitals in the country are reporting on a daily basis about uh, uh, well, the, the, the hospital uh, bed capacity, the ICU uh, uh, occupancy rate, the, uh, the ventilator utilization. So all these uh, very, very important aspects that, were, that can allow us to monitor the situation in the different hospitals. Uh, so this is, this is also a very, uh, very important tool for us to, to, to monitor the, the situation, not just in, in Manila, but, but throughout the country. Uh, so uh, the, the ECQ, Enhanced Community Guarantee has really been used by the government to increase that testing, isolation, and treatment capacity. I mean, uh, we're talking to the mayors here. They obviously know this very well. Uh, we really have real-time and transparent data sharing. I mean, I'm currently in Malaysia, uh, and I, I hope there's nobody from Malaysia uh, online, but I can assure you uh, there is no such thing as real-time and transparent transparent data sh sharing here in, in Malaysia nor in any of the other countries uh, in the region. Philippines is really 
quite uh, uh, unique in how transparent it is with its data sharing. And the whole of government response, I know this is something that most countries are really uh, uh, um, uh, using, but the, they have that actual day-to-day um, uh, -day, uh, coordination between relevant uh, uh, government departments, and not only at the national level, also at the, at the regional and at the provincial level. Uh, is really something that allows for that coordinated response. Uh, coordination with LGUs, obviously, uh, there you are. Uh, they're very important to ensure that at the, Dep the, the Department of Health guidelines, and not just Department of Health, uh, but other relevant government departments as well, are being uh, adhered to at the local level, uh, particularly, uh, as said earlier, uh, uh, the, the contact tracing, the isolation, uh, uh, etc. Um, the fact that you are on a regular basis revising your quarantine measures depending on uh, the situation at uh, even up to the barangay level uh, is really uh, an important, uh, um, yeah, uh, an, an effective tool to, uh, to deal with this, um, with this pandemic. Uh, the fact that the government has been providing financial support to those who have been economically affected, which is an incentive or should be at least an incentive for those people who have symptoms that do not have the ability to isolate at home, to go into one of the uh, uh, LGU uh, um, quarantine uh, centers or isolation centers for self-isolation. Uh, uh, so the key challenges, obviously, uh, I'm telling you nothing new, uh, but what, of, course, of course in the Philippines, we, we do have a situation on our hand where we have a lot of high-risk areas and a lot of vulnerable populations as we uh, tend to call them. The very, uh, yeah, a large number of crowded and informal settlements, including the detention centers, obviously here in, uh, in the Philippines, the detention centers are also uh, quite, uh, quite overcrowded. Healthcare settings will always remain uh, a high-risk area, uh, but also those centers that were used for quarantine of uh, repatriated overseas Filipino workers in the beginning were identified as a major source of infection. So instead of being protected from the infection, because that is basically what the quarantine is all about. The centers for quarantine were actually the source of infection, but that has been corrected. Uh, and mass gatherings for, for aid distribution have also been identified as a main uh, reason for uh, uh, the ease of the spread of the disease. Um, and of course, the, the, the locally stranded individuals and everything that is related to uh, the, uh, yeah, the facilitation of them returning to their home provinces. Uh, again, that enforcement uh, of the public health measures uh, that we all have identified uh, in line with WHO and Department of Health guidelines that we all know are basic and, and, and key to, uh, uh, to minimize the spread of this disease. The devolved health system is, of course, a key issue. Uh, what is the role of the Department of Health uh, and what is the authority that the Department of Health has uh, at the LG level to indeed enforce uh, those public health measures? A chronic shortage of health workers is, uh, well, and, and will remain uh, an issue until that is indeed uh, being uh, structurally uh, addressed. And the stigma among uh, suspected even uh, COVID-19 cases and health workers remains an issue, and not just in the Philippines, but globally. And with that, I thank you very much. Uh, and if there are any questions, I'm very happy to, uh, to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, great. Uh, that's a great overview uh, to get us started on this lab. We've covered, uh, you've covered a lot of ground um, and I can see questions starting to, to come in and we'll circle back to answer those questions uh, later. So uh, let, me, uh, let me proceed to our, our second topic. Uh, but before I start, let me ask the audience again a question. Uh, this time, one on uh, telemedicine, which you're going to flash on the screen and ask you to answer in the same way like you did before, no? So the question is, how will you rely on telemedicine for your health needs? A, exclusively for COVID-19 health concerns only. B, just for non-COVID consultations. Uh, uh, the third option, preferably specialty referrals. And the fourth, any health issue that requires my attention immediately. So how would you use uh, telemedicine. These are your four uh, possible responses. We'll give you a few seconds and then we'll flash up the answer. And this will nicely tee up our next topic, which is of course going to be on telemedicine.
Okay, well, uh, overwhelming majority, 88%, uh, will say they would use health, uh, telemedicine for any health issue rather than just focusing on, uh, on, on a COVID-19 health issue or a specialty referral. So thanks very much. And um, we can now proceed because this tees up our next uh, question. Our, our next uh, topic, our next speaker will talk about the use of telemedicine against COVID and how tech and uh, mobile healthcare can help us manage this pandemic. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Eric Tayag. He's currently director of the Department of Health Knowledge Management and Information Technology Service, where he provides overall direction to provide plans, policies, programs for sector-wide information communications technology services towards better health results at all levels of the healthcare system. Ladies and gentlemen, let's please welcome Dr. Eric Tayag. Thank you, Bill. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the organizers of this uh, webinar, notably the Livable Cities Challenge or Lab and the Globe Telecom family. Uh, can we share our slide, please? Okay. This is a truly a livable cities challenge. How do we exactly deliver health services when they have been severely disrupted by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic? Who knows when it's gonna end? Will there be other disease outbreaks, for example? Will there be excess deaths due to COVID-19 pandemic? Are livable cities a panacea because of the pandemic? Next slide, please. Just 200 days after the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as a public health emergency of international concern, we have over 21.2 million cases and three quarter of a million deaths. The Philippines has had its own share. When I turned 62 last April, it was just over a million in the country. In the Philippines right now, my calculation of the doubling time based on a three day moving average is 31 days. Just between the ranges of 30, 70 days we're in, we can be comfortably under a general community quarantine. The next few days, however, will be critical as doubling time is expected to add more days or perhaps we don't want this, the reverse, which is going to be dire. Next slide, please. Every public health measure thought to address the containment of mitigation of the pandemic were well considered by official authorities including our mayors who are attending this webinar. Good afternoon to our mayors, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. And independent experts, mostly based on science or experience, and to which the civil society responded the same way as we consider them so serious. Well, cities, however, had to calibrate their responses to protect everyone and allocate resources, for example, of what is readily available at their disposal as much as what they can actually outsource. Look at how we have responded to the crisis so far. So we have to create an emergency operations center at the DOH and have the interagency task force on emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases established so that we can coordinate the implementation of our responses from the different government agencies. Um, we were able to provide you from the data sources that uh, will require information, immediate information for which uh, guidance from uh, program implementers and uh, policy makers would want to share with you at the best possible time. Uh, we have now 100 testing facilities and we hope that uh, our capacity is now enough 
if it is not enough, then there's always room for improvement. The dedication of dedicated COVID-19 hospitals, shutdown hospitals, central and community quarantine facilities are still uh, mushrooming. And uh, because we have anticipated that a large number of Filipinos will still require services from these facilities. We have continuously provided you with public advisories and um, we have also received your critiques and this, these are welcome for us in the Department of Health because we want to make sure that uh, improving the quality of our messages becomes and should always be a priority. And the, these public advisories are meant to uh, promote the detection, location of every Filipino who needs to be tested, uh, trace as in contact tracing, so that those who have exposures should be quarantined and those who are sick will be isolated, taken care of, treated, with medicines, quality medicines that have a prior approval. And of course, even the disposition of uh, dead bodies have been taken into consideration. And since March, we have provided the DOH COVID-19 hotline. That's the 1555. The widespread use of technology and innovation was a no brainer. But exactly how did we fare with technology? Next slide, please. In this slide, we list down the challenges and vulnerabilities. Thus, there remains quite a discrepancy between what is desired and what actually happens in communities. In this particular case, the cities. Let us take, for example, the challenges and vulnerabilities as we listed them here of cities to promote to their citizens this containment or mitigation measures. How do you exactly put out to a large number of households, especially of uh, cities that are teeming with overcrowded households and you tell them to stay home and they are desperate to get there, go back to work, find essential commodities that they can bring back to their homes, practice physical distancing, wear masks every time it's required, have themselves tested, uh, if their contacts, they have to be quarantined, and when they're sick, they have to be transferred to a facility that have isolation, uh, that can management isolation requirements, treating these patients, maintaining infection control. These are challenges. These are daily challenges. In fact, as soon as we wake up, we think about this, and before we sleep, we worry about them. Next slide, please. As much as governments were quick to introduce measures to salvage deflated economies, uh, such as providing stimulus packages, new work SOPs, preserving mobility and other freedoms, a balancing formula was badly needed to avoid the worst consequences in case the agile public health interventions were unintentionally negated. So the WHO listed these approaches for the new normal, that the disease transmission is under control, that the health systems are able to detect, test, trace, isolate, and treat every case. And of course, we're able to find and then minimize vulnerability in places such as prisons. Settings such as schools, whether or not there's going to be a hybrid education, workplaces, whether or not there's enough infection control guidelines, and other essential places or establishments, 
if they have really uh, invested in measures that are concern, considered preventive. And the risk of importing new cases from the overseas Filipinos who decided to come back. Can we manage them? And that communities remain fully educated, engaged, empowered, even as they face stigma and discrimination. Next, please. There's only one health imperative, ladies and gentlemen, saving lives. But to save lives, one must conjure the possibilities that bringing about the impact of our collective resources to face health challenges and welcome health opportunities is a priority and there is no other alternative. And thus to save lives for us in the health sector, we must improve the access to health services. And when there is access to health services to ensure that there is effective patient care and that we value coordination of end-to-end -end service delivery between health facilities and cities can learn from their own lessons and marshal their resources so that these health imperatives are also their priorities. Next slide, please. This is a busy slide, but let's, I'll walk through you through it. Okay, over here at the left side, we have the digital health interventions that are available to us. Uh, it's telemedicine, it's health information systems, and tracking and notifications. But we have to describe them in terms of improving access, quality, and bringing down costs. Let's look at telemedicine, for example. So it addresses, for example, the absence of access, whether it's because of distance, whether because there's a cultural barrier, and this remote access is provided by telemedicine. Now, the provider shortage, as uh, mentioned, by Sasha earlier can actually be something that can be addressed with telemedicine because in telemedicine there is access to online providers. Now the quality of telemedicine while it may be variable it's directly to the patient and there have been studies that it actually decreases cost in the long run. And so our mayors can uh, actually think about telemedicine as part of your services to your constituents. But what exactly is telemedicine? For the uninitiated, we define for your telemedicine a technology that was actually introduced many decades ago and which had gathered momentum only in the last two decades in developed countries and only much recently to limited resource countries. The private sector have been busy changing the last landscape with this technology, especially in the Philippines. And we learned that government intercession is the missing puzzle piece to accelerate its development. Next slide, please. There is, however, prevailing hesitancy for rolling out and scaling up telemedicine. How is that so? Well, we have this telemedicine first principles, for example. It's about equality. DOH cannot imagine if we introduce any telemedicine platform that there will be many who are left behind. So we think so much if we introduce um, applications on smartphones 
if the balance is not in favor of those who do not have these smartphones. So that's why we encourage third party developers if they have to partner with us or government that these actually are taken care of. And then there is public resentment against any breaches in privacy. And so therefore we have to address privacy and data usage concerns. And we always believe that science should always provide guidance so that we can have a transparent and auditable algorithms that makes triaging if this is about telemedicine because triaging is an important component of telemedicine. It's the start of how we provide guidance to those who access telemedicine services. And then we have to also consider digital deployment strategies that support specific groups. So we have to categorize them into healthcare workers, for example, the older persons. And of course, there's individual consent, always. Next, please. So how should we go about with our telemedicine in the country? In this slide, we show you that there are different forms or models, if you want to call them. There's the hotline model, the partner model, and the health facility-based model. Let's describe each one. Next, please. Well, in March, um, right after the instructions from Secretary Francisco Duque III that we have to provide information the best way we can to many Filipinos, especially in Metro Manila, to allay their fears, anxiety. So with DILG, Smart PLDT, we were able to establish a 24-7 DOH hotline. That's the 1555 as shown in the screen. In the early days, I functioned as a call center agent, would you believe? And then as we rolled it, we began to accept telemedicine consultations and the demand was increasing. And so we had to find ways how to have telemedicine services using a hotline model. So we partnered with medical societies, with medical institutions, the academe, so we can provide a long list of telemedicine volunteers that can cater for the needs of those who access this platform. Next slide, please. We realize that it will take a village or what we would acknowledge among technology and innovation advocates. We need a system, we need an architecture. In this slide, we show you a simple architecture of how you can start your telemedicine using the hotline model. And so therefore, it will require patience, resources, and there should be good cooperation between the participating facilities, offices, agencies, for example. Next slide, please. We never relied on just one model because the actual situation would actually prevent us from rotting with just one solution. So we introduced third party telemedicine apps and Consulta MD was among those who was a pioneer in joining hands with the DOAs. So thank you Globe, Consulta MD for rising to the challenge of this second model. The, and uh, when we introduce it, it's now on a subscription basis and it's very reliable and we had thousands 
of teleconsultations using this platform. Next, please. Now we are in the stage of a facility-based model and uh, Mayor Joy Belmonte is listening. We have to commend your staff and officials in Quezon City because they have successfully piloted a model for telemedicine that uses a healthcare delivery network. Congratulations, Quezon City. And uh, in the next few days, we will ab be able to actually activate the telemed telemedicine platform for Quezon City using this new model that actually links it to the electronic medical records. Amazing. Next slide, please. And of course, the lessons learned, we should not forget that these lessons are valuable to us because the access of patients through ICT will always be a driver of telemedicine. But we need regulation and that's why we uh, have reached out to lawmakers so that a law that promises to provide regulation on telemedicine can actually be institu institutionalized in the near future. And financing can shape the cost-effective provision of telemedicine and we hope that uh, PhilHealth would uh, improve telemedicine through this uh, financing, albeit that uh, the PhilHealth are, is currently facing uh, challenges on its financial capability. And of course, there's opportunity to mature the requirements for uh, telemedicine. Uh, we are working with DICT so that the co connectivity, for example, can be improved. Now, let's not forget best practices. Okay? Here we show you that when we set up, technology becomes easier when the goal is clearer and when partners actually collaborate. The policies are backed up with evidence and data and there is third party monitoring. Next slide, please. medicine services well we have to provide ict equipment okay and that includes connectivity we have to have a coordinated strategy and of course the infrastructure should be there next slide please ladies and gentlemen as i wind up my presentation this afternoon think Number one, is telemedicine for you? Number two, how would the poor benefit? Exactly how? Number three, what could be a fair professional fee if telemedicine providers will ask for this? Number four, how do we handle liabilities? Number five, or maybe this is just a fad. And lastly, the last slide, please. Please remember, when we are pushed against the wall, we should always open doors and open them right away. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Director Eric, uh, for your um, presentation on telemedicine. I did not realize that you were a former call center agent yourself, so <laughs> you would know exactly how this how this works. I think uh, I can see some questions coming in, uh, Director Eric, so uh, we'll get back to that uh, a little later on. 
during our our open um, our open forum. So let me uh, uh, let me proceed to our next session, and it's a nice transition into the uh, same topic, still on on telemedicine. Uh, maybe before I start that session, let's ask another question from our audience. No? And let's flash the question. The question is, when was the last time you talked to a doctor? Was it this month, last month, more than six months ago? When was the last time you talked to a doctor or you talked to your doctor? Give it a few more seconds and let's see the response right after that. <clears throat> okay, two thirds uh, uh, say that they saw their doctor uh, more than six months ago and then uh, we're split evenly between this month and last month. So let me congratulate uh, the 18% who said this month and the 18% who said last month. And uh, the more than six months ago, 63%, uh, uh, and I guess I would count myself uh, in, that, uh, in that group. So let's continue our discussion uh, on digital health delivery. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Cholo Tagaisai. He's the founder, managing <clears throat> director, president, and now COO of Consulta MD. Cholo has 14 years of executive experience in technology, spanning all stages from startups to growth companies and IPO. He started his career in Globe back in 2000, and his ex executive experience then grew as he assumed leadership positions in various startups outside of Globe in the Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Bangladesh. He rejoined the Globe family this month as Chief Operations Officer of Consulta MD. So uh, let's... Uh, Welcome, uh, Cholo Tagaisai of Consulta MD. Cholo? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm trying to start my video.
Good morning, uh, Good morning po. Uh, okay. This is Dr. Parillo. How can I help you? I'm the Chief Operating Officer uh, of Consulta MD. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity to uh, share with you today what Consulta MD is all about. Uh, good afternoon to all the mayors, vice mayors in attendance. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to share with you uh, how Consulta MD can provide the healthcare uh, to all your constituents. I'll just share my screen. Okay, so just uh, uh, a little background. So Consulta MD uh, has been in operation for over five years already. We're uh, part of the Globe family. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it's the relationship with Globe that's actually allowed us to grow into uh, the biggest telehealth company uh, in the Philippines. So uh, a critical pain point with telehealth is how do I pay? Uh, you can't pay with cash because the very definition of telehealth is hindi kayo magkasama ng doktor. So you're at home and the doctor is somewhere else. So cash is not an option. Uh, kung credit card naman, uh, less than 2% of Filipinos have a credit card. Uh, uh, Consulta MD is the only telehealth provider that allows payment via mobile load. So we know that uh, uh, while most people will not have a credit card, uh, ev uh, everyone uh, either has load or a postpaid bill. So uh, that integration with Globe uh, it's really uh, what's allowed us uh, to grow uh, in, into where we are right now. So what's Consulta MD? So Consulta MD is a telehealth service that provides access to skilled and licensed uh, Filipino doctors. So you can, uh, you can access Consulta MD via an app, uh, via the web, uh, or via a hotline. It's the hotline actually that uh, I would put the most emphasis in because uh, uh, not everyone uh, has a smartphone. Uh, not everyone has fast internet connection. Diba? Marami dyan nakiki Wi-Fi lang. So when all, of, when all those things aren't present, uh, gagana pa rin ang consulta MD because you can simply call uh, our, hot, our hotline. So uh, Consulta MD provides uh, medical advice, general health information, uh, proper medication. Uh, we dispense e-prescriptions, uh, e-laboratory requests, uh, and e-medical certificates. We also provide uh, a mental health service. So while we would never claim that uh, telehealth uh, is better than a face-to-face -face with a doctor, uh, uh, it's when when that's not possible, uh, telehealth is the next best thing, uh, which is the situation where uh, most of us find ourselves now. Uh, we're working from home. We don't want to leave the house. 
but we want access to a doctor. That's where telehealth uh, and consulta MD uh, can come in. Uh, so there are three things that make uh, consulta MD unique. Uh, mabilis, mura, 24-7. Uh, uh, so the uh, uh, director Tayag touched on this earlier that uh, uh, telemedicine uh, can address uh, the cost issue of healthcare, and I think uh, KMD can contribute uh, very strongly to that. Okay, so mabilis. Uh, with Consulta MD, you can talk to a doctor immediately. Uh, we are the only telehealth service where if you call the number, yung doctor na mismo yung sasagot. So it's not an operator, it's not a chatbot, uh, it's the doctor itself. Uh, himself answering uh, and uh, the main point here is there's no need to make an appointment so if if hindi ka makatulog uh, it's 3 in the morning iniisip mo may COVID ba ako you can simply call a consulta MD and may doctor na sasagot ka agad sa'yo uh, right then and there uh, so mabilis siya and uh, more importantly, Mura. Uh, so if you think about uh, the cost of a doctor's consultation, Mura na ang uh, 1,000 pesos. Uh, with KMD, you can talk to a doctor for as low as 15 pesos. Uh, and yung 15 pesos na yun, unlimited yun for the whole week. You can call the doctor as often as you want for your peace of, peace of mind. So 15 pesos per week is our consumer offering, uh, but our pricing for LGUs is even much lower. Uh, we're 24-7. So doctor na nga yung sasagot uh, immediately, anytime, all the time pa. So we, uh, we, we have full-time KMD doctors uh, and we deploy them in three shifts. So, May 7 a.m. to 3 p.m., may 3 p.m. to 11 p.m., 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. So uh, we're always available, we're always online. Um, this is just to show you how the app works. So um, we have an app. Uh, you can also access us via the web uh, or simply call our hotline. So, uh, uh, be, uh, so Consulta MD has a consumer offering, uh, but beyond that, uh, we also work uh, with uh, companies, uh, uh, the, gover the national government, uh, and of course, LGU. So uh, over five years, uh, these are the companies that have uh, chosen uh, to trust their healthcare uh, with Consulta MD. So um, with companies, uh, the way it works is uh, KMD is provided uh, as an additional layer uh, to their HMO. Uh, that's particularly relevant uh, these days. Uh, because uh, most employees are working from home. Uh, so uh, telehealth is really the most uh, relevant uh, benefit uh, uh, an employee can receive. Uh, we work closely uh, with uh, uh, Director Tayag. We, uh, we work closely with, uh, with the DOH. So recently, 
uh, we did a partnership where we plugged in uh, DOH volunteer doctors uh, on the Consulta MD platform uh, and provided uh, free consultation. We've also partnered with uh, OWWA uh, where we uh, provided free consultation to uh, OFWs that are quarantined. Um, so, uh, what, what we've done with uh, Sir Sogon, uh, with uh, Governor Escudero, uh, is really a great example of uh, the end-to-end -end solution that we can provide uh, for LGUs. Uh, so, um, our basic service uh, is really uh, uh, the hotline, uh, uh, the app, uh, web access. But uh, uh, for LGUs, uh, uh, LG, LGUs might have uh, special customized needs. So in the case of Sorsogan, for example, uh, there were certain areas na uh, yung mga tao wala, walang smartphone, uh, walang Wi-Fi, uh, walang LTE. So, uh, and in some cases, uh, walang telepono. So the way KMD came in is uh, we worked uh, with their health centers. So what happens is uh, KMD comes in uh, to augment uh, the existing uh, supply uh, of doctors uh, in the area. So for example, uh, uh, in a health center, uh, typically uh, a doctor can only come in, let's say Tuesday, Thursday. KMD can come in and fill Monday, Wednesday, Friday through a virtual clinic. So this is how a, a virtual clinic would look like. So, uh, you know, there's a terminal, uh, there's video, there's uh, uh, diagnostic equipment, uh, and uh, you, know, uh, you, you, you talk to a doctor. Um, so uh, it's a full end-to-end -end solution uh, that KMD uh, can provide uh, uh, uniquely because uh, we're part of the GLOBE family. So uh, how can KMD help LGU? So uh, first uh, and most basic is we provide a telemedicine option for your constituents. No need to leave home to talk to a doctor. We can augment uh, your health centers. Uh, you can use KMD to fill uh, the days, the hours when no lo local doctor is available. Uh, we can even do customizations where uh, we plug in uh, your local doctors uh, in your local hospitals and, and enable scheduling. So uh, our business model is uh, we, uh, we simply charge one low flat fee uh, per constituent uh, and that uh, provides them unlimited call access already to KMD doctors. So uh, cost factors would be uh, the number of constituents uh, that you would like to be covered. Uh, the, uh, the larger the constituent base, uh, mas mura bumabaktak yung cost. Uh, other cost, cost factors would be, do you have uh, uh, special needs? Uh, do we need to set up uh, a health terminal? Uh, in your uh, in, in your clinic, uh, will you need globe connectivity? Uh, uh, what other uh, customizations uh, would you require? So those all factor uh, into the cost. Uh, we're we're very uh, excited uh, to be part uh, of your uh, local uh, healthcare solution. Uh, if you'd like to work together, please uh, email me uh, at info at globaltelehealth.com.ph. Uh, I look forward to continue the discussion with you later uh, in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Cholo. Uh, great presentation on uh, Consulta MD and how this works uh, both for patients and for LGUs. I see some questions coming in and so we're going to be able to circle back and uh, address a lot of the questions that I see uh, coming in the Q&A box. Uh, 
Okay, let's move on to the last session um, for this afternoon before we go to Q&A. And uh, it's something that uh, Sasha already alluded to earlier, which is mental health. Uh, so we're gonna get into this topic. Uh, but before I get into that, let me ask you a question again and, and, uh, and take an online poll among all our uh, participants or audience. Uh, let me ask the question now. What is the most significant stressor you faced during this pandemic? Has it been work and employment or family and personal relationships or health or current events or financial? I'm sorry you're not allowed to answer all of the above. You're going to be given a forced choice here, but is it work and employment, family and personal relationships, health, current events, or financial? The question is, what is the most significant stressor you faced during this pandemic? <clears throat> we'll give you a couple more seconds and then we'll go to the responses. Okay, oh, it looks like we're uh, uh, quite uh, distributed. Current events, 30%. Uh, work and employment, 26%. Uh, followed closely by health and financial. So uh, it, it seems here that uh, family and personal relationships are the uh, uh, least significant among stressors. So I guess everyone gets along with their, with their family and with whoever they happen to to be with uh, uh, in their households in spite of being locked up for the last four or five months. But the concerns are revolving around work, health, current events, and financial. So this uh, sets us up for our final topic of this afternoon, which is mental health. Uh, we've been months into the COVID-19 pandemic and the world we know is on the verge of another health crisis, a mental health crisis. As death toll and infection rates continue to rise, how can we identify early signs of emotional distress and how do we adjust to this new normal? We're going to hear from a Filipino physician and mental health advocate, Dr. Gia Sison, as she explores the pandemic's emotional toll and shares coping strategies as well as insights in the Philippines COVID-19 response. Dr. Gia specializes in occupational medicine and is a graduate of UST. She is the former chief medical officer of Global Telehealth Incorporated and co-founder of Health XPH which promotes a responsible use of social media and healthcare. She was a project consultant to the WHO Western Pacific Regional Office on health lifestyle, health lifestyle in the workplace. She is currently the head of Makati Medical Center's Women Wellness Center, and she's a staunch mental health advocate and life and leadership blogger. She hosts her own digital series, which talks about life, love, and anything mental health related. And she is also the resident doctor of Boys Night Out on Magic 89.9 FM radio. Uh, I haven't listened to Boys Night Out in quite a while and I didn't realize it had a resident doctor. So I'm learning something new every day. So Dr. Gia, you've got a great background and um, uh, a great advocacy. Let's please welcome Dr. Gia Sison. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Bill, and uh, thank you to Livable Cities and uh, Globe Business for inviting me this afternoon. So I'm here to talk about making mental health accessible um, and making it uh, possible uh, as part of a livable city. Next slide, please. Uh, first, we have to define what mental health is. Date, when we talk about mental health, it actually defaults into something that is negative. But when we look at it as a whole, uh, by definition, it's actually a state of well-being where one realizes uh, full potential, we are able to cope despite the stresses in life, and we are able to serve our, communi our community. Uh, and we have positive relationships. And having positive relationships doesn't mean zero conflict. We may have conflict, but we can actually address, address them and learn from them at the same time. Next slide. And when we look at the biopsychosocial model of health, we're not talking about just the biological aspect. It's not just the physical aspect, 
but there will always be a psychological aspect and a social aspect. When COVID-19 hit us, uh, it hit everything. So in general, it really hit on health as a whole. Next slide. And so these are six points are six among so many mental health concerns during the time of COVID. Uh, we are at uncertain times. We are still evolving and trying to find out what the behavior of the virus is. Quarantine facilities are actually sources of stress in terms of risk of isolation and loneliness, especially if you are a COVID suspect or a COVID uh, patient. There is actually an increased stigmatization in communities as well. Just to share as a doctor, I have encountered a lot of uh, concerns from the frontliners who have actually been kicked out of their dormitories and uh, condominiums because the admin found out that they were working for a hospital. So we really have to aim for the de-stigmatization of mental health. There's an altered grieving process. Personally, I have lost an uncle because of COVID-19 and we couldn't grieve. Hindi po kami nakapaglamay because by DOH protocols, kailangan makirimate within, within 12 hours. So there is really this complete alteration of how, li how, how lifestyle is. And it's not already the new normal. It's actually how it's going to be from now on. And of course, uh, there are al already a lot of barriers in terms of accessing um, health services that are non-COVID related. We have seen a lot of patients uh, suffer, if I may use that term, in terms of access to dialysis. And as a cancer survivor, um, I have had received concerns about patients who are unable to access chemotherapy sessions because of transportation challenges. And of course, the next wave will already be mental health related because of so many uncertainties we are surrounded with. And of course, there is amplification of social divides, economic, health. And that's why uh, when I was listening to the lectures earlier, and also a disclaimer that I am part of the advocacy of DOH and Telemed, and of course, previously uh, with Consulta MD. Whenever I engage in teleconsults, nararamdaman ko po talaga yung uh, need ng pasyente in terms of a doctor being there to assure them of what they're feeling and that yung continuity of care sa healthcare will be there. So next slide. So who are actually vulnerable to mental health concerns? The answer is everyone. Everyone is affected at different degrees, but everyone, we need to work on an inclusive community to address this. Next slide. And when we look at the social ecological model, yung, uh, itong nasa right side po natin, it tells us that our individuality or individual action is actually shaped by the community that we are living in. So when you look at the outer uh, parts of the circle, hindi mawawala yung community, yung public policy in terms of how we are in terms of knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs. So we really need to work hand in hand because at the end of the day, hindi po natin yan kakayanin alone. So we have to look at this model to be able to appreciate and look at everything from, uh, from a macro standpoint as well. Next slide. So cities and municipalities uh, can actually be areas and we should make these areas an actual intervention for mental health to be accessible to everyone. Next slide. Uh, this study uh, was published last April 2011 and they actually studied understanding the pursuit of happiness in 10 major cities. Um, itong article po nito was built upon the premise of existing literature that identifies 
yung ano ba yung predictors of happiness ng 10 urban areas which is outside the Philippines in terms of health, in terms of wealth, financial, and in terms of social connectivity. So dito, um, they found out that the cities that provide easy access, that make it affordable and readily there, not only in health, pati lahat ng aspects, uh, pati sa public transportation, pati uh, even in terms of leisure, where they can actually rest uh, in practice uh, recreation and cities that are actually affordable and serve as good places for, for them to raise their children. These are factors that were considered in this article last 2011. So next slide. And this slide is a summary of the urban mental health impact mechanisms. So take into consideration example social isolation and loneliness. Uh, when we look at it, it's actually uh, a problem dito. It's mixed. And it's, uh, it's associated with uh, yung urban versus rural. An urban household tends to be smaller and uh, more mobile. Versus a rural, um, rural residents who tend to be superficially friendly, but they tend to go to the city to offer probably more social opportunities. And thus, to your right side, ito yung strategies that they have found to be effective in being able to address this um, mechanism. So to encourage community cohesion is very important. So positive interactions among neighbors, uh, although that is not possible now because we all know that physical distancing is one measure that we have to practice. However, we can always make social connectivity possible. And of course, inclusivity. On the next slide are a lot more urban mental health impact uh, mechanisms that we need to address, like transport conditions too. Uh, it may have both positive and negative impacts. So we now evolve into um, actually, hindi na po innovation because other countries are already practicing. However, making bike lanes accessible, improved walking should be encouraged. Lalo na ngayon when, where even in GCQ, meron ng reduction dun sa, in terms of transport conditions. So when you look at this whole slide in this study, it will actually help no, in terms of planning, especially uh, addressing mental health accessibility. Next slide. So how can cities do better when it comes to mental health? Because we live in this uh, definition or this mantra that there's no health without mental health. And after launching the mental health law, we really have to realize the importance of it more than ever, especially now. Next slide. So adopt a local policy for mental health. Um, psychological first aid is actually something that you may want to acquire in your cities because uh, by definition from the American Psychiatric Association, um, being able to offer PFA or psychological first aid even via telehealth consult is actually an effective measure to address um, the, the trauma from, from what happened to us. And we're seeing a rise also in cases, although as we speak, wala pa po tayo documented numbers in terms of gaano ba ang tinaas ng rates of depression and anxiety in this condition. But adopting a local policy can actually help, uh, help, it, help LGUs move forward. Referral networks are very important. We have to build it from a community level too. Gusto po natin i-move out also yung uh, thinking that it's always hospital-centric because at the rate our human health resource, our, um, psychiat our psychiatrists uh, are available, medyo mababa po talaga yung hindi kakayanin kung lahat. So we have to make it accessible at a community level. And of course, uh, ensure adequate funding when it comes to that. Next slide. 
and integrate mental health in the COVID-19 response. So just like uh, the Red Cross is doing uh, basic first aid, etc., we have to really consider that one of the, the next need that we may have to incorporate in our response is psychological first aid again. So it's proactive, no? Kasi ang nangyayari kasi dati, uh, it's reactive. But of course, COVID hit us by surprise. But now that we're trying to already study the flow, we have to be more proactive and thus inject mental health access into our policies. Caring for the carers program, uh, we have to consider that because uh, frontliners are getting um, burnt out. And of course, everyone should be a frontliner at this point, taking care or behaving as if all of us are um, infected by the virus because we have to get this behavior of taking care of one another. And uh, community meaning making of the pandemic in schools and workplaces should always be there too. So, we have to ensure that there is effective crisis and work communication. So here are five points that we have to remember. Give people what they need when they need it. Communicate it simply with credibility and be consistent. Develop a plan, including mental health access. Respond to misinformation. And make sure that you involve your community whenever you make policies. Next slide. So these are just the suggestions and moving forward uh, because I think COVID gave us a chance to be able to build uh, a better future that we want to have. So this was uh, from the urban health study on the impact of urban design in uh, mental health. So kasama na po yung parks Jan. So next slide. Promotion of active space for exercise, but of course with caution uh, because and we have to take into consideration yung how how the how our roads are structured as well. Next slide. Make cities safe. No, in Manila they have this ordinance of uh, safe spaces, and I think that should be advocated all the more now to make it uh, to make the streets well lit, uh, and have ordinances also to protect uh, the people. And of course, inclusivity, especially for those yung mga PWDs po natin. Next slide. And improve transportation and connection as well. Bike lanes, etc., and make it more accessible. Next slide, please. So this is to summarize the Mind the Gaps framework, which was uh, taken into consideration when they made this study. So Mind the Gaps, Gaps actually stands for green places, active places, uh, pro-social spaces, and safe places to actually be uh, one with the community and make mental health friendly cities a norm in our better normal. Next slide. So I think that ends my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gia. Um, I really appreciate the very holistic approach I think that you're taking to um, mental health uh, and, and care for people and uh, how cities can help in a variety of ways, uh, not just the direct counseling, but in a very holistic fashion uh, for this. So we're going to get back to some questions uh, in a short while. Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, I noticed one of the questions that has been asked has to do with access and uh, you know if people are isolated or they're far or they have no connectivity uh, how can they take advantage of uh, of some of these services like telemedicine and consult the MD and uh, finding out more about COVID well that's uh, that's a good question in fact because uh, a lot of this requires uh, a lot of this connectivity requires more infrastructure without the infrastructure we have congestion and uh, we have uh, uh, signals cut or very slow speed. And so I'd like to maybe uh, just have our staff show a short presentation on telecommunications infrastructure and its importance, and then we get into the Q&A. 
malaking bahagi ang ginagampanan ng internet sa buhay nating mga Pilipino, lalo na ngayong panahon ng new Pero hindi lahat kaya magpagsabayan, lalo na sa mga lugar na hindi naaabot o sadyang walang maayos na signal. Kaya naman, ang mga telco katulad ng Globe, maigting na nakikipagtulungan sa mga LGU para maisaayos na ang signal at serbisyo para kay Juan. Pero ano nga ba talaga ang dahilan ng mabagal at pawala-walang internet connection? Digitalization requires reliable connectivity. Kapag mas maraming cell sites sa isang lugar, mas malakas din ang signal na maibabato para sa voice, data at SMS services. Pero nalilimitahan ang pagpapatayo ng mga ito dahil sa iba't ibang mga rason. Sa ngayon, napipilitang maghati-hati ang maraming internet users sa Pilipinas sa signal na kayang ibato ng kada isang cell site kumpara sa mga kalapit nating bansa sa Asia. Sa pinakabagong datos ng Globe nitong second quarter ng 2020, mas madalas nang gumamit ng data ang mga Pilipino. Mas malaki ito ng 48% kumpara ng 2019 o katumbas ng 584 petabytes ng data na dumadaan sa Globe Network. Bakit nga ba hindi tayo makapagpatayo ng mas maraming cell sites? The bureaucratic red tape uh, is enormous. There really isn't any mechanism to make sure that permits are granted in a predictable, consistent, and of course, time-bound uh, way. If anyone objects to a cell site being put up in a neighborhood, the whole thing stops. Sa kabila nito, sinisikap pa rin ang globe na mas mapabilis at mas maparami pa ang mga naitatayong cell sites kada taon para sa pagpapalawig ng mas epektibong network rollout. Sa katunayan, Naglaan ng globe ng 1.2 billion US dollars in capital expenditures o capex kung saan ang majority nito ay napunta sa network at capacity builds. Sa kasalukuyan, nasa 34.2% na ang capex to revenue ratio ng globe. Nagpo-provide ito ng latest cellular technology na 4G o LTE sa milyon-milyon itong subscribers. At nito lang nakaraang taon, inilunsad ang 5G service para sa Globe at Home na magiging available na rin sa mobile sa mga susunod na buwan. 5G promises to be a revolutionary development on uh, networks. A sharp break from 2, 3, 4G to a completely different uh, infrastructure and architecture. Sa naganap na press briefing sa Malacanang, naglabas ng panukala ang gobyerno para mas mapabilis ang pag-i-issue ng mga permit. Dito po sa bagong GMC namin, kasama yung lahat ng ahensya, pati LGU, uh, 16 days to 20 days po ang, ang uh, target para yung lahat ng permit ay tatakbo. Ipinaliwanag ng pamunuan ng Globe Telecom ang karaniwang mga suliranin sa pagpapatayo ng cell site sa Pilipinas. We are suffering ho from many many years of this, uh, 25 to 29 permit, umabot ng walong buwan. Tapos marami pa kong kaming mga miscellaneous fees po. Sa mga ibang crossing tower fee, meron kaming special use permit. Ang order ko sa cabinet ngayon is to really take the drastic measure that you can find. Handa rin makipagtulungan ng Globe sa mga LGU para sa pag-streamline ng proseso. Well, our objective is to transform people's lives. It's part of our purpose as a company. What we look for are, you know, say, willing LGUs. Help comes really allowing us to build. With no red tape with respect to permits or right of way, no special fees. You know, that is what I think will be a catalyst for us to continue to build. Sa pamamagitan ng digital transformation initiatives ng Globe, mas marami pang mga Pilipino ang makararanas ng mas maayos, mas mabilis, at mas makabuluhang digital experience. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's now proceed to our Q&A. We have still some time for 
for plenty of questions actually. So let me uh, call back and reintroduce our panelists today. Sasha Butzma, Technical Officer on World Health on Health Emergencies at WHO. Dr. Uh, Director Eric Tayag, Director of the Knowledge Management and Information Technology Service at DOH. Cholok Tagaysay, Chief Operating Officer of Consulta MD. Dr. Gia Sison, Head of Women's Wellness Center at Makati Medical Center. And uh, let me add uh, uh, Dennis Javier, who's going to uh, be willing to take any of your questions on uh, technology infrastructure if you need technology infrastructure. Um, okay, let me uh, start off with some questions. Uh, unfortunately, Mayor Lani Mercado uh, really had to leave, but uh, I, she, I think she's got a good question. I'd like to direct this to Cholo. Uh, how can LGU doctors participate in uh, Consulta MD? Okay, so um, um, I showed this earlier. Uh, Consulta MD can come in. Uh, to augment your existing doctors, uh, and that, uh, but also we can plug in your existing doctors to the platform. Mm -hmm. So your uh, your your local doctors, uh, your local hospitals, so that it's an end-to-end -end experience. Mm -hmm. So I, I go on Consulta MD, I consult. If uh, if my concern uh, needs uh, uh, needs to be elevated to a specialist, then uh, we can refer you to a local doctor, uh, enable scheduling with that doctor, and en enable scheduling with the hospital. So all of that is possible uh, uh, with KMD. Okay, great, uh, Cholo. So that means then an LGU doctor can ride on your Consulta MD platform, so you can yeah. enter into this partnership with a with a city with an LGU. Okay, that that's great. Yeah. I have a question for uh, uh, Director Eric. And it's a common question and a question, in fact, that, that I think about a lot is, let's say I want to go into telemedicine, what, how do I get a prescription? And how do I make sure that a, a pharmacy, a drugstore will honor that prescription? Is there such a thing as an electronic prescription? Yes, Bill, we have uh, introduced uh, electronic prescriptions for a hotline that is the 1555. We made it simple. So the prescriptions are sent through emails or through their uh, smartphones so that they have a copy of the prescription. And we make sure that this is centralized so that there will be no uh, fake prescriptions and we are able to protect the clients who have access to our telemedicine services. Thank you, Bill. Okay, thanks, Director Eric. So you mean to say that uh... If I were to ask for an electronic prescription, it can only come from uh, uh, the COVID-155 hotline. I cannot get it from my own doctor or I cannot get it from Consulta MD or any other uh, uh, telemedicine platform. It must only come from uh, your, uh, your hotline. It will be different for other <laughs> telemedicine providers, but if you access the 1555, then it will be a different procedure from those who are also uh, providing telemedicine services. So uh, Consulta okay. MD will have a different procedure. That's what oh, I'm indeed. trying to explain. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Director. Um, yeah, so Cholo, maybe I'll go back to you. So Consulta MD gives electronic uh, prescriptions? Yes, yes. So uh, for, uh, about 40% of our calls actually involve uh, dispensing e-prescriptions. Okay. So you can you can receive the uh, e-prescription through the app. It can be through email, or if you don't have either, it can even be through SMS. Okay, and uh, can the prescription be filled out uh, electronically through a drugstore? Meaning, do you have to physically go to the drugstore, or can you just send it to a drugstore and they can deliver the medicine to you? Well. Um, uh, across uh, ac uh, across uh, Ayala Healthcare, uh, there are actually multiple touch points. So uh, there's uh, uh, there's Medica, there's uh, Medgrocer. So uh, uh, you can actually order uh, the uh, and fill the prescription online. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question here for Dr. Uh, Gia. Uh, Given that we have minimum face-to-face -face, uh, interaction with people because of all the isolation and quarantine, 
uh, what are the concrete ways to provide psychosocial support to those in isolation? I think you mentioned earlier people in quarantine centers and isolation centers, for instance, uh, face a lot of stress. So how do you provide that type of psychosocial support? Uh, we can uh, make use of technology. Uh, in fact, uh, this is where uh, telemedicine is very useful because they can call a number and they can just vent how they feel. And they can probably also promote psychosocial activities remote, remotely while in quarantine. So there is this feeling that they're not undergoing it alone. May kausa pa rin sila. And they have constant activities while practicing, of course, not just the minimum health standards, but maximum. So it's really, uh, they can call a hotline where they can talk to someone. Okay, thank you. Um, Sasha, I have a question, couple of questions here for you. One is uh, for COVID, uh, is there a self-medication? And uh, number two, are these uh, face shields uh, important requisites for full protection? Uh, I guess maybe uh, this is a reaction to the to the government order that uh, face shields are now mandatory if you want to go on public transport. Uh, so are they necessary, face shields together with masks? Of course, I, I, I added a, a response in the, uh, in the Q&A already. Okay. I don't want to contradict the Department of Health, obviously, <laughs> or any government regulation. And this is why also we are saying as WHO, and we have to be uh, in line with what the, uh, any government in any country is, is saying. But as WHO, we're not recommending face shields. We're, we're recommending face masks. Uh, we're recommending the, the social distancing, uh, the, the, the simple uh, hygiene. Uh, but face shields is more for uh, health workers, uh, for people who have uh, direct contact with infected uh, patients. So in a way, uh, that is... Uh, a guideline that uh, uh, governments can uh, decide to, to use or not and to adapt. So up to that extent, it's also really important uh, to uh, align with what, what governments are deciding. Yeah, so <laughs> I know it's a bit of a diplomatic uh, answer, but uh, of course as WHO, we cannot uh, go uh, against the advice of a, of a government. Sorry uh, to put you on the spot there, Sasha. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> okay uh, All right, Sasha. You saw it coming, uh, Bill. I saw it coming. <laughs> no, okay. so for the self-medication, uh, uh, definitely not. Uh, so this is something, of course, that has also been in the news in the past couple of months. Uh, uh, there's this uh, one person in the United States who, uh, who uh, seems to think that there is this medication that uh, uh, has not been proven uh, effective at all is, is uh, indeed useful. So please do not do that. Go with whatever uh, advice uh, has been provided uh, by uh, uh, yeah, the Department of Health in this case in the Philippines as well as the WHO at a global level. But so far there have been no uh, uh, specific medications uh, identified for uh, COVID-19 that are helpful at all, if particularly not for self-medication, no. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, uh, Sasha. Uh, Dennis, are you on the line? I've got a question for you. Uh, how do we ensure, how do you ensure access of telemedicine, especially in far-flung areas uh, where, where they don't have access to, to basic services and they don't have access to uh, digital signal or connectivity? Thank you, Bill. Um, actually, uh, that would depend on the uh, infrastructure in the area. Uh, we are happy to hear about the joint memorandum circular that was signed by uh, under the EILG. It's a major development towards our goal to improve, uh, to build more infrastructure in order to provide this service to the LGUs. Uh, we continue to work with the LGUs and the government uh, agencies to be able to streamline the permits, get approvals faster that will allow us to build right away. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Dennis. Um, I noticed a number of uh, participants have raised their hand to ask questions. I hope they're still on. Uh, let me call on uh, Maria Luth Rago. Uh, you had raised your hands for a question. Uh, would you like to ask your question now? We can turn on your video and uh, microphone. Are we able to find? Uh, are we able to find her? If not, let me call on Danilo uh, Kasubuan. He's got his hand raised for a for a question. Uh, Danilo, would you like to ask a question?
Okay, while we're waiting uh, for the questions to come in, let me ask a question here. Uh, this is, let me go back to Cholo. Uh, how do doctors with a private practice, not linked with any hospital, so an independent private practice, how can they be part of Consulta School of Doctors? They're not connected to any hospital. Okay, so uh, Director Tayag uh, mentioned this in one of his slides earlier. So there are, there are different models uh, for telemedicine. There's the hotline model, there's the partner model, there's the virtual clinic model. Uh, KMD actually covers all of those models. So uh, uh, on one hand, uh, we do employ full-time uh, KMD doctors. That's what allows us to provide uh, the instant 24-7 uh, coverage that we do. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we also have uh, freelance doctors. So freelance doctors uh, come onto the platform, uh, they set uh, their available hours. Uh, uh, so, so para siyang grab. So meaning to say a doctor can plug into the system, say, okay, I am available Tuesdays, Thursdays uh, on, the, on these time slots. And then the, the platform allows uh, booking uh, uh, between patient and doctor. Ah. Okay, thanks. And uh, I noticed, uh, Cholo, you have uh, partnerships with uh, a number of LGUs. Uh, in your experience, has Consulta MD been used like a 9-11 uh, center where people have to call in and actually get emergency response or ambulances to, to pick them up and send them to emergency? Has that ever happened to you? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, um what happens is uh, Consulta MD becomes your first point of point contact. It's your gateway to the healthcare system. So whatever it is, uh, uh, whether it's an emergency or not, we've received calls uh, from people saying, Hindi ako makahinga. <laughs> so uh, in which case, we immediately refer them uh, to the nearest hospital, to the nearest doctor, to the nearest clinic. Uh, but yes, emergencies, uh, have been part of the call. Okay, thanks. Uh, let me go back to Director Tayag. Uh, still on the yes, subject of uh, electronic prescriptions, uh, would you know which of the drugstore establishments are accepting or honoring electronic prescriptions? Is it all of them or uh, just a few? There are many of them. Uh, we have not received reports that these prescriptions were not actually uh, uh, dispensed uh, with the corresponding medicines as listed in the prescription. And I would want to add, Bill, because of the video presented earlier, that mm -hmm. the Anti-Red Tape uh, Authority has already issued a joint memorandum circular last June that will streamline the process for the applications of telecom so that cell sites would not be a problem when they want this to be uh, built for example, with the uh, towers. Mm -hmm. And uh, also I'd like to add that uh, in Quezon City, the telemedicine platform is different because unlike Consulta MD, well, where they wait for random calls, here we have a model where in the telemedicine provider is the primary care physician where in the clients are actually matched. Thank you, Bill. Okay, thank you. Oh, that's interesting. Um, let me see if there are other questions here. Um, let me ask a question for Dr. Gia. Um, uh, like, uh, do, do, are there a pool of uh, mental health counselors uh, that, uh, that you work with so people don't keep just calling you but uh, uh, are able to call others as well so that you can expand your reach? <clears throat> Um, the National Center for Mental Health has a crisis hotline bill, uh, and there are several CSOs that are actually offering their services for free. Um, I'll type it on the chat where they can actually click the link, and there are a lot of service providers that are willing to give uh, their uh, psychosocial support for free. Okay, thanks. Yeah, well, so we'll wait for you to type that into our chat, and we'll make sure we, we distribute yep. that to, to all. 
Um, okay, thank you. Uh, let me move to uh, my second to the last question, I guess. Let's say, um, uh, Director Eric and, um, and, and, and Cholo, uh, it, it is a good question. Are there instances where telemedicine uh, has been abused and are there security measures that regulate uh, uh, against such abuse, no? Uh, how, how do you know your how do you know you're talking to a real doctor, for instance, or that you are getting a, a good advice? Okay, any technology can be abused, Bill. That's why uh, we want to make sure that guidelines are actually followed. So we have policies or guidelines that also allows us to monitor performance of telemedicine services that are actually provided. And we are very strict on this. And uh, perhaps the lawmakers can now appreciate so that they can accelerate the, um, the bill that uh, is pending in Congress and possibly Senate can, the Senate can follow through so that uh, we can institutionalize procedures and protect clients from uh, telemedicine services that uh, can be considered scams. But we hope that this is, this is not happening and if this is happening, then the clients have to report them to us, to the Department of Health, so that uh, we can have remedial measures if we need to do that. Thank you, Bill. Yep, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Director Eric. Uh, Chola, how about you guys in Consulta MD? How do you, how do you uh, uh, practice sort of a quality control and prevention of abuse uh, in telemedicine? Well, all KMD doctors uh, have to pass through uh, a screening process. Uh, they have to be doctors to begin with. <laughs> um, and uh, they have to go through uh, uh, thorough training uh, to be able to provide you know, uh, uh, a standard of care uh, 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 that, that's acceptable. Uh, we're, we're definitely not a scam. <laughs> as, as you can see in, the, in our slides, we work closely with the director Tayag, we work closely with the DOH. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've, uh, we've, uh, we're the largest telehealth player and we've been around for over five years. So uh, when you call uh, the KMD hotline or use the KMD app, you're most definitely assured you're talking to a, uh, to a real licensed doctor. Okay, great. Thanks, Cholo. Uh, another question for you, Cholo. Uh, I don't know what LGU is. Uh, uh, there's a question here from Ferdinand Sarabia. What will it cost our LGU for the telemedicine platform? Um, the, so, uh, um, the uh, excuse me, yeah. Cholo. Um, yeah. LGU stands for local government units. Okay, thank you. What, what is it, uh, Director? Sorry, no. Uh, LGU stands for a local government unit. So yeah. it can be a city or a municipality. Thank right. you. Right. And, and is there any, uh, uh, I guess they're asking for cost to join uh, sure, uh, sure. the telemedicine platform. Sure. So I, I guess for, for context, uh, our, our vision and mission is really to be able to touch as many Filipinos as possible. Uh, Six out of ten Filipinos die without ever having gotten to talk to a doctor. Uh, Consulta MD wants to change that. That's why our pricing to begin with uh, is already very low. Our consumer offering is just 15 pesos. You can already talk to a doctor for as low as 15 pesos. Our pricing for LGU is even much lower. Uh, it goes as low as one peso per day uh, or 30 pesos for a month. So for one peso a day, uh, you can talk to a, to a licensed doctor uh, as often as you want already. Uh, I think in terms of bringing healthcare to a mass market, uh, it really can't go lower than that. <laughs> Piso mm -hmm. Piso per day, 30 pesos per month. So uh, we deliberately priced it that way uh, because uh, we're very enthusiastic to work uh, with LGU. Okay, thanks. Uh, Bill, we're, we're yes. piloting a unique telemedicine platform in Quezon City. And in the next few weeks or months, this will be the benchmark for other LGUs to adopt. Of course, uh, the LGUs can consider other options like the Consulta MD platform. 
but we Secretary Duque the Third uh, will be announcing soon that uh, the telemedicine platform for LGUs will be available before the year ends. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Director. Uh, good to know. Uh, let, let me just quickly respond to two questions here. Uh, on, the, uh, on the evidence that uh, uh, there's no spread in schools, um, well, it, it's too early for us to tell, I guess, in the Philippines, because schools really have been cut off uh, for quite some time. Um, I think they were not able to, schools were not able to complete the last term uh, before they took the summer break and now are not allowed to, to start. So uh, uh, we're going to see how that goes. Uh, uh, but for the moment, there will be no uh, uh, in-person uh, teaching or learning uh, on the part of our schools, at least until October, I think is the new date uh, for, for the public schools at least. Private schools can open uh, uh, earlier. Uh, there's a question also about will the DILG uh, joint memorandum circular work to cut red tape? Well, it's a pretty new circular and we're about to find um, uh, find out whether this is going to, to work. Uh, if you see suddenly a lot of uh, cell site construction uh, ongoing by the telcos, then you will know that the joint memorandum uh, circular is uh, is, is working now. So let me close with the last question. I'd like to ask all the, our uh, panelists to uh, respond. Uh, there was a question here that uh, there have been a lot of good recommendations and guidelines issued by DOH and by, by WHO. And so the question is really, is it, um, uh, is, uh, is it, it's maybe not a matter of the guidelines, but a matter of the implementation. So uh, what, so if you were to give a, a wish list of the top one or two things that we should concentrate on to, to, to manage the uh, uh, COVID spread and the pandemic and bring it uh, and, and flatten the curve, what one or two items would you recommend uh, for people to, to follow so that we can all uh, jointly manage the, uh, the numbers downward? Um, uh, let, me, let me start first of all with, uh, uh, Dr. Gia, can I can I start with you? <clears throat> well, dealing with this uh, pandemic is really a community effort, so everyone has plays a part on this, and uh, continuous reiteration and education about what COVID is, busting fake news, busting uh, what COVID is not, and uh, let's let's not stop at that as well. Let's move beyond. Uh, the pandemic in itself and address also the um, pressing needs that surrounds it. And I would always go for the mental health concern as well when it comes to that. Thank Great. you, Bill. Thanks, thanks, Gia. Let me, let me go to Cholo. Cholo, what would you uh, recommend the one or two things that we really need to do to, uh, to address the health issue and address COVID? Well, I'll, I'll uh, build on Dr. Gia's answer. Uh, I think the better educated people are, uh, the better uh, they can uh, uh, help themselves uh, prevent the spread. And I think telehealth plays a critical part of that. Uh, the more, uh, uh, the easier your access to a doctor, uh, the better information you'll have, the more educated you'll be, uh, so you can uh, act accordingly. So I think that's the role of uh, telehealth uh, in solving the problem. Okay, thanks, Cholo. Now let me move to our, our, our two health professionals. Uh, let me start with Sasha. Sasha, from your perspective at WHO, what would be kind of the uh, uh, sort of one or two must-do items that you think is necessary for, for managing this pandemic? Well, I really believe, and I, I also answered that in, in, in one of the, uh, actually one of the other questions, uh, but, uh, but this has been, uh, you know, the, an issue that is not only with COVID, uh, uh, but that we know that is uh, one of the, uh, the, 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 maybe not the sources of the, of the problem, but the, the issues with implementation of guidelines. I mean, we've seen it last year with the measles outbreak, we've seen it with the dengue outbreak, we've seen it with the polio outbreak. It's really the guidelines that are being issued at the national level are not necessarily being implemented in, according, in accordance to the guidelines at the LCU level. So this is uh, uh, something that uh, we have seen uh, is a, yeah, it's a structural issue within the, the health system that 
uh, I owe to the fact that it's, that it's a devolved health system. The Department of Health is a regulatory department, whereas the Department of Interior and Local Government is the, the implementing entity. So there needs to be that, 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 that stronger uh, 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 coordination, uh, uh, well, not necessarily at the, at the national level, but, but more at the community level. Uh, so that is, that is definitely something, uh, yeah, I, I really wish for all the LGUs to take at heart, uh, all the mayors and vice mayors, uh, the importance of the proper implementation of existing guidelines, because the guidelines are there and they are uh, very clear on what should be done and what should not be done. It's just following them. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sasha. So it's community uh, community-led community implementation that's important. Let me give the last word to Department of Health, uh, Director Eric. Uh, Thank you, uh, Bill. Your, your, your must-do uh, recommendations to manage okay. the pandemic. Okay, I hope this is not going to uh, result in controversy, but uh, the one thought that I have to share with you is that trust government. When government makes decisions and provide procedures so that we can prevent the spread of the virus that causes the COVID-19, it's based on data science discussion with key stakeholders and including the World Health Organization. And if they don't work, then you have to give us feedback. And exactly what Sasha has said, local government, uh, local chief executive, the mayors who are here, are key so that we can work together and make sure that our goals are aligned and that people are aware of what they have to do and we have to follow through, we have to monitor. So when we say stay home, stay home, wear masks, with or without a face shields, wash your hands, physical distancing, and as we wait the vaccine, act as if there's no vaccine yet. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you, Director Eric. I think that's very practical advice. Uh, it's sort of the uh, everyday advice which people can practice uh, on their own, actually, without having to go to, uh, to a hospital or, or anything like that. So again, the, the basic minimums, you know, wear the mask, uh, hand hygiene, and social distancing. And... Uh, uh, thank you, Director Eric, for the for the great practical advice. Um, we've come to the end of another uh, great session, our third Livable Cities Labs. And first, I'd like to thank all our speakers and panelists for their insights and and thoughts. And I'd like to also thank the the audience for the questions. Uh, I think we tried to cover as many questions as possible, but uh, if we haven't. Uh, we still keep a compilation of the questions and we will try to answer all the unanswered questions and circulate that as well. I'd like to invite all the participants as you exit to answer the feedback form that will appear once you exit this webinar. Uh, for those of you who wish to receive a certificate of participation, please fill out the feedback form with your name as you wish it to appear on the certificate. So if for those of you in Zoom, uh, the feedback form will appear on your screens as soon as you hit the exit button. And if you're watching on Facebook, just take a picture of the QR code that you see right now on your screen and you will receive the feedback form. Uh, again, type your name in uh, as you would like it to appear on your uh, certificate of participation. And uh, when you send in the uh, feedback form, we will send you your certificate of our participation in a few days. Uh, again, Copies of all presentations will be made available uh, and, and sent to you on, on email. I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you uh, to our next lab, uh, Wednesday, September 2nd, 3 p.m. again. And uh, the topic will be data analytics for cities. So how we use data science and data analytics uh, to manage uh, cities. So if you want to be a data-centric city, this is the session for you. Uh, thank you very much uh, to everybody for attending today's session. Before we formally close our program, we would like to share with you a tribute video to all Filipino small and medium scale enterprises from Globe My Business. Uh, Globe My Business honors the hard work and resilience of Filipino micro, small and medium scale enterprises, especially during these challenging times. Enjoy, thank you, and enjoy the rest of the day. Good afternoon.
the sun will come out tomorrow bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there'll be sun just thinking about tomorrow clears away the cobwebs and the sorrow till there's none when i'm stuck with the day that's gray and lonely i just stick out my chin and grin and say